Women in War and Wasps. This is the story of the women who flew for their nation during war, serving their country and doing their patriotic duty. These women flew every aircraft in the United States military, transports, fighters, and bombers to their decarbarkation points. When they were declared surplus to the needs of the nation and released, their service was classified secret for almost 30 years, from 1944 to 74. Important to note that the full political participation in one's nation is intimately tied to one's ability to serve and participate in the nation's military. The British Empire came apart after the World Wars in part because so many colonial subjects had served and then clamored for representation, rights, and independence. In the U.S., women got the, the vote in 1920, 19th Amendment, after so many were involved in the Great War effort. Black men received suffrage after the Civil War, 13th Amendment, after many had fought for the Union. White American women had all been, always been considered U.S. citizens, but not full participants in the duties and benefits required of U.S. citizens. Betsy Ross, American Revolution, 1775-1783. Embargoes and boycotts of British goods. The marketplace was often where women made their voices heard. The women were able to influence the spending of their family monies. This in turn influenced the merchants that sold the goods and services. It's not easy to generalize about the women of war in American history. It's more complicated than people at first might realize. There were no clear divisions dividing the home war, home from the war fronts, particularly during some of our earlier wars, like the Revolution and the Civil War much of which were fought in people's backyards. At the Battle of Monmouth, which took place on a sweltering summer day in Monmouth County, New Jersey, Continental forces under General George Washington faced off against British troops under General Henry Clinton. Mary brought water to the parts of American troops until her husband collapsed, either from the heat or after being wounded, after which she supposedly took his place and helped operate cannon for the rest of the battle. A soldier who witnessed the action later wrote about it in his diary, without referring to the woman of all by name. While in the act of reaching a cartridge and having one of her feet as far before the other she could step, a cannon shot from the enemy passed directly between her legs without doing any other damage and carrying away all the lower part of her petticoat. Molly Pitcher at the Battle of Monmouth, New Jersey, 1778. The Civil War, 1861-1865. The Victorian era was marked by stark sex roles or separate spheres. The man in the ideal was the husband provided was successful in the emerging industrial marketplace outside the home. The feminine ideal was as the angel of the house, providing refuge from the cruel world outside. Beautiful women protecting her and her domestic lives is why he fights. Little Wig Falls Flag for the first Texas imagery. Over eighty percent loss of regiment in the cornfields of Sharpsburg Antietam. The highest percentage of casualties of any regiment in a single battle during the war. Nine standard bearers fell before a Pennsylvania private picked it up. Lost to Texas for decades until it was returned under President Theodore Roosevelt's project of national reconciliation in 1905. Now in Texas State Archives in Austin, Texas. Isabella Maria Bell Boyd. Confederate spy, La Belle Rebelle, Amazon Secessi, etc. Learning that Union Major General Nathaniel Banks' forces had been ordered to march, she rode 15 miles to inform Confederate Major General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson, who was nearby in the Shenandoah Valley. Boyd later wrote, The Federal pickets immediately fired upon me. My escape was most providential. Rifle balls flew thick and fast about me, so near my feet as to throw dust in my eyes. Numerous bullets whistled by my ears. Several actually pierced different parts of my clothing. Jackson captured the town and acknowledged her contribution and her bravery in a personal note. Though not a beauty, said to have been a, had a bewitching charm upon most any man she met. Once captured, she sang Dixie through her jail cell window while waving the Confederate flag and continued to communicate to agents outside. Arrested six or seven times. Camp followers, families, and camp together and impersonators. Civil war and ad hoc enterprise in many cases. Few physical exams required. It was a volunteer war, especially at the beginning. Whole families and towns signed together. Mary Frances Louisa Clayton, in disguise to serve the Union. One role I haven't mentioned is women as traditional keepers of the dead, the mourners left behind, the ones who tend to push most for memorials for their husbands, brothers, and sons, of making meaning from so much loss. First women photojournalist in late 19th century war, the Philippine-American War of 1899 to 1902. 
Francis Benjamin Johnson domesticates war by photographing Admiral Dewey aboard the Olympia as he relaxes and listens to the man. Nursing, ambulance drivers, Red Cross. 80 female doctors in Europe by 1918. Tending soldiers and civilians as typhoid influenza, Spanish flu swept the European continent. The Spanish flu killed up to 100 million people in less than 11 months. Telephone operators employed by the military. Countless women were employed in the factories and in munitions manufacturing. Minorities and women were able to get high paying jobs and make excellent wages because all the able bodied men were on the battlefield. The call for women to join the workforce during World War II was meant to be temporary, and women were expected to leave their jobs if the war ended and the men came home. The women who did stay in the workforce continued to be paid less than their male peers and were usually demoted. But after their selfless efforts during World War II, men could no longer claim superiority over women. Women had enjoyed and even thrived on a taste of financial and personal freedom, and many wanted more. The impact of the World War II on women changed the workplace forever, and women's roles continued to expand in the post-war era. What made World War II different? In many ways, it wasn't. In total war, combatants mobilized the entirety of their society's resources in order to wage the conflict. Civilians as part of that effort are considered legitimate targets, so the war finishes with unconditional surrender and the utter capitulation of one side. So was total war usually defined. This definition contrasts with the idea of limited war, in which the war fighting abilities of the combatants are constrained by external, usually non-military factors. The eras mostly defined with total wars that period from 1861, the American Civil War, to 1945, the end of World War II, and the creation of the nuclear stalemate. Within this period occurred a series of wars that were seen, both at the time and after, as unprecedented in the amount of effort and the execution and mobilization required. Thus, the American Civil War is still seen by Americans as the most wrenching war in the country's history. World War I, 1914 to 1918, and World War II, traditionally 1939 to 1945. These latter two wars are the paradigms of total war, wars in which the utmost efforts of most global societies were turned to the struggle, wars in which civilians were routinely targeted, wars in which the massive economic and demographic might of the combatants was officially turned into martial power. There were old ideas and new ones. When were used in advertising, this was not a love affair. Cochrane gained experience working in the Royal Air Force in Great Britain. When Cochrane came back stateside for a visit, she had lunch with President Mrs. Roosevelt and impressed him with her plan to form a women's Air Force unit. Roosevelt wrote her a letter recommending introduction to Assistant Secretary of War with a recommendation that Cochrane submit a proposal to start work on forming such a unit immediately. Unfortunately, wires in high command were crossed when General Arnold Air Force gave Nancy Love control of the project to form the WAFs, Women's Air Force Services. Meanwhile, feeling betrayed, Cochrane rushed back from England to consult with Arnold, who ended up giving her command of her own, the WFTD, Women's Flying Training Detachment. The two groups were eventually merged into one, the WASP, Women's Air Force Service Pilots, and the two women were given different leadership positions that allowed them to stay out of each other's way, Cochrane Director and Love Head of Ferrying Division. Avenger Field, Sweetwater, Texas. Dry, dusty, flat, perfect for an Air Force training facility. One of the lesser-known roles women played in the war effort was provided by the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, or WASP. These women, each of whom had already obtained their pilot's license prior to service, became the first women to fly American military aircraft. They ferried planes from factories to bases, transporting cargo and participating in simulation strafing and target runs, accumulating more than 60 million miles in flight distances, and freeing thousands of U.S. male pilots for active duty in World War II. More than a 1,000 WASPs served, and 38 of them lost their lives during the war. Considered civil service employees and without official military status, these fallen WASPs were granted no military honors or benefits, and it wasn't until 1977 that the WASPs achieved full military status. Application, training, daily life, why join? 25,000 applicants, only about 4% were accepted and made it through the training program at Avenger Field, 1,102. They had to have already possessed a civilian pilot's license 200 hours of flight time, at least 5 foot 2 and a half inches tall, or 18 and a half years old. They also had to pay their way transportation-wise to the training facility in Houston, Texas, Howard Hughes Field, no matter where they were in the nation. On their first day, trainees were told to memorize all the instruments located on their training plane for the following day's test. 
Elaine Jones of Houston flew until 3 a.m. and doesn't mind the hard board of the bench used for a wasp bed. Jackie Cochran specified that wasp dress uniforms be blue. These were designed and tailored specifically for women, and to ensure her desired design passed, Cochran made sure that a beautiful French girl modeled the blue uniform while a female military clerk modeled the drab olive color. The blues won. Wasps were first to wear the blue Air Force dress uniforms several years before the men. Here are the summer khakis in the middle and the Eisenhower jacket and pants in the Santiago blues. The training zoot suit. Men's hairy bone twill coveralls. The small size is 44 long. The media was still quick to assure the audiences they're feminine. The Houston Post referred to them as a lipstick squadron. Here's the BT-13 trainer that they flew. Casualties. 38, men, 38 women were killed on duty. Hazel Lee, daughter of Chinese immigrants, tried to serve in China before America entered the war to fight Japan, was, was denied. On a forced landing in Kansas field, a farmer began chasing her with pitchforks, screaming, Japan is invaded. Eventually, she convinced him to stand down. Soon after, she was involved in a crash and died. Cornelia Fort was a civilian flight instructor who worked near Pearl Harbor after the bombing decided she needed to offer her services to the U.S. military. During a routine training flight, her BT-13's wing struck her flight instructor's landing gear, causing her plane to spiral into a dive and crash. The first Bowman pilot in American history to die in active service to her country. Because wasps were not militarized and still technically considered civilian, they did not have flags draped over their caskets, nor did they receive benefits nor burial expenses. These women who served the U.S. Army Air Force were denied burial in veteran cemeteries and veteran status until 1977. Civilian or military? Initially skeptical, Henry Hap Arnold was a Cochrane convert by 1944 and gave a speech at the last WASP graduation ceremony saying, Frankly, I didn't know in 1941 whether a slip of a young girl could fly the controls of B-17 in heavy weather they would naturally encounter in operational flying. The unusually expansive general concluded, well, now in 1944, more than two years since the WASP first started flying with the Air Forces, we can only come to one conclusion. It is on record that women can fly as well as men. The bill to militarize the WASP was defeated. Despite push by Arnold, WASPs were dismantled in December 1944. Not until 1974 would women fly again in the Armed Forces, first for the Army, then in 76 for the Air Force. During the 70s, former WASP lobbied intensely for recognition as veterans of World War II, and President Jimmy Carter finally granted the military status in 1977, with full veteran status coming in 1979. In 2010, President Obama granted the Congressional Gold Medal for their service. Here is a picture of the graduate at the WASP Museum in Sweetwater, Texas. Pifanilla cartoon, designed by Walt Disney Studios for a proposed film of Roald Dahl of the Gremlins. Wasp asked permission to use it and was graciously granted. Sketch created by an unnamed wasp. As you can see from the media attention, wasps were not ignored while they were in service. However, their story was buried in classified secret for 30 years. Korean War B-29 Super Fortress with Fifanella on the front. As the first female pilots to serve the U.S. in wartime, the wasps sought to fulfill their duty as citizens of the United States, regardless of sex, and it took several decades, but they were finally recognized as full citizen soldiers who performed valuable necessary service to the country during his time of need. They also proved that women can be excellent pilots, making it possible for future generations of young women to take up the Santiago Blues as well. Today, there are 62,000 women serving in the U.S. Air Force. Hope you enjoyed this program. Hope you learned something. And please visit the Adventure Field Wasp Museum in Sweetwater, Texas. It's a wonderful place. Miss Katie Snyder, wrote most of the verbiage for this slide show, this PowerPoint. She was a great help, and she's now working on her PhD at William Mary University. Thank you.